So here at Calvary Chapel, Cuna, we have been working our way through the book of Romans. But this morning, being that it's New Year's Day, you know, I began to pray and just ask the Lord, hey, would you have me continue through the book of Romans, or do you want me to do something else? And, um, and after praying through this, I, I felt like the Lord had directed me to the book of Philemon. So if you would, go ahead and join me in uh, opening to the book of Philemon, where we get to start out with this, um, this message, this, this, little, this little book that Paul wrote, and, um, and learn from that. If you're unfamiliar with this book, don't blink, because you will pass it. Um, but it's between Titus and Hebrews, and it's just one chapter, 25 verses. But before we get into this study, let me go ahead and just address the elephant in the room. How many of you do New Year's resolutions? A few, okay, okay. As you, I'm sure, are well aware, the, when a new year approaches resolutions typically approach. Now, it's not always the new year. You know, you can make a resolution any time of the year. Um, but new year is, is a fresh start, right? You, you think about everything that happened in 2022, and then now you move into 2023, and you're like, all right, now this is a fresh start where the things that I did back then, I don't have to do anymore. The direction that I was going then, I don't, well, I don't really want to go that direction anymore. I want to go a different direction. And so we see that there can be a tendency where the new year brings about people beginning to plan and, and um, set in course how they can implement these changes in their life. Uh, but I know, you know, for myself, I, I didn't raise my hand because in the past when I have made resolutions, I am, my, my success rate is not too high. I set these lofty goals, and I'm, I'm like, man, I'm going to resolve to do this. And, you know, you're good for the first couple weeks, and then a couple months, you know, it's like, oh, I haven't been doing so great. And then, you know, before I knew it, I wasn't, uh, my resolution was a long-lost thing. Um, and I would, I would become discouraged, and inevitably, you know, I, I would fail. Now, there have been times where that hasn't been the case, but, you know, my... Uh, the point of all this is not to discourage you if, if you are one to set resolutions and to say, hey, you guys are going to fail this year. Amen. Let's go. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it's to encourage you. You know, setting goals for yourself is a good thing. You know, we all have a target. We all have a general direction that we want to go. Maybe we don't really think about it all the time, but we have a, a path that we want to take. And we need to have goals in our life to be able to help us accomplish those things. But statistically, looking at this, Barna research shows us that, uh, you know, typical resolutions in the new year, 30% revolve around things such as weight loss, diet, and health. 15% is on money, debt reduction, or some sort of other financial goal. 13% um, re re resolve to uh, see personal improvement. 12% uh, resolve to kick some sort of addiction. 5% focus on their career-related goals, and another 5% focus on spiritually-related goals. Now, those are just like the, big, the bigger numbers, if you will. You know, I'm sure there's many other, other things that people will resolve to do, but seeking change in your life is not always a bad thing. In fact, we can see that change helps us reorient the trajectory of where we're going. And sometimes that's, that's actually a really good thing. But through this book of Philemon, what we end up seeing is that there's these men who they resolve to change something that's going on in their lives. And they resolve to be different. They resolve to um, see forgiveness happen. And so we see one man by the name of Onesimus, who's walking a worldly life, hears the good news of Jesus. And he resolves to change his path after he accepts the Lord. After he began to walk with the Lord, he found him in this situation where he needed help. And that's where Paul comes into this picture. Now, this book of Philemon is one of Paul's smallest letters that is written during his ministry. Um, Paul wrote this as, uh, in the prison in Rome while he was awaiting trial to begin. And during the same time, he wrote three other epistles, that of Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. And this little book has a very specific purpose. And so I don't want to lose sight of the purpose of, you know, the main emphasis being on forgiveness. Um, and just say, oh, this is all about New Year's resolutions, and let's all make one, and hoorah. Um, there, there is a purpose in this book if we read it in context. 
Um, but, but we see that Paul focuses on, on writing this letter to this man, if you could have guessed it, by the name of Philemon, um, who is... The, who Paul is writing this to, this man that's known to be a wealthy man, he's known to be a well-to-do Christian friend of Paul's who had a church meeting in his house and he had many servants. Um, but the second man that we see, that we will see as we get into the study, is a man by the name of, of, of Onesimus, who was a servant of Philemon's at one point. Now, while he was Philemon's servant, he chose to leave his obligations and run. And he ran away from his masters so that he could be free. And this all occurred before Paul wrote this letter. Now, we're told, we're not told of all the circumstances and what led to him running away. Um, but, but what's believed is that he, ha- he probably stole something. And then he was on the run um, because when, if you were a slave, and yet if you were a slave that stole something, that could be punishable by death. And while he was on the run, though, and living his life, he heard the good news of Jesus, and he became a believer. He put his faith and trust in the Lord, and that put him in an interesting position because he had the opportunity to resolve what he was going to do moving forward. Paul also had the opportunity to resolve what he was going to do, what he was going to do as Onesimus had become and been considered profitable for the ministry, for the advancement of the gospel. In other words, the whole reason why this letter was written was because Onesimus owed Philemon something, and instead of paying up, he ran. In the process of being on the run, um, Paul met him and developed a a ministry relationship with him, and through this, we see this conflict, this, this this resolve occur as Paul writes this letter on behalf of Onesimus. And throughout this time in this book this morning, we will see this important lesson on forgiveness and how to, how to handle conflict. And maybe, you know, as we get going, maybe for you, that is something that you need to resolve this year. That there has been some hurt, some brokenness within your, within your own heart, within your own relationships. And there's something that you need to resolve to change or to redirect so that you will see help. Because we all know that living in unforgiveness is like bitter water. If we allow that into our hearts and into our lives, we will not see health. We will not see growth. But we can learn how to resolve our differences and allow that to be a launching pad into personal growth. So we're going to go ahead and read the first seven verses together um, as Paul introduces this letter. So starting in verse 1 in the book of Philemon, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers hearing of your love and faith which you had towards the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Let me pray for our time and and then we'll continue on. Lord, we thank you as we get into your word that you, you tell us that you will be with us. Lord, you have sent your Holy Spirit into our lives to lead us, to guide us, to direct us, um, to, to convict us, Lord. And maybe we're here this morning and you know we want a fresh start and we want to set the course into this new year to go in a different direction than maybe what we've gone in the past. Or maybe, Lord, you're just going to speak to our hearts about something that wasn't even on our minds or our hearts, and, and uh, we need to change. We need to redirect so that we can see health and growth within our own lives. God, I pray that um, your word would, would penetrate our hearts, that we would have hearts that are ready to receive what it is that you're trying to teach us, and that we would have ears that are ready to listen. We thank you and we praise you for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we saw here in these first seven verses, this was a standard introduction 
uh, that Paul had in these letters. He would start out by introducing who he was and those who were involved. And as it was Paul's custom, he, he notes that you know, he's, not, he's not a prisoner of man. He's in prison right now. But he's not a prisoner of man. He's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. He starts out by saying that because, you know, in the midst of his circumstances and situation, he could easily say that he was put in prison because of what man did. But God had a plan through this. God had put him there for a reason. And so he acknowledges that. In the book of Acts, when they tried to bring Paul in for trial and to imprison him, he appealed to be sent to Rome and to get an audience with Caesar. And so he ended up starting his journey off there, and, and he got to the point where, you know, he had, he had been in prison for a while, but he had been given liberties to be able to more or less, he was in kind of a house prison, um, been given the liberties to continue to minister, to continue to write these letters, and continue to encourage those who he could um, in the Lord. Now, Paul then addresses who this letter was being written to and the relationship that he had with him. And we can see that it was this man by the name of Philemon who he personally considered to be a beloved friend and a fellow laborer. Aphia is believed to be Philemon's wife, and Archippus is believed to be their son. And this man, Archippus, is a man that oversaw church operations for the Colossian believers, that Paul had provided him an, a strong encouragement in the book of Colossians, if you were to read there, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 17, where he says, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So he was a servant of the Lord as well. So this whole family was dedicated to serving the Lord and to, serve, and to be giving the glory to God. Now, Bible commentators believe that um, these three individuals were part of the creation of the church, of the Colossians church. And it was through that relationship that Paul was able to write this letter and to um, really to make the plea that he did, to encourage his fellow brother in the Lord to, um, to really show his love and his faith that he had towards all these other saints, towards his servant that had run away. Now we see that Paul appeals to that love and to his compassionate heart. And that love in the heart was a refreshment to others, and he wanted it to be the same towards Onesimus. So continuing on in verse 8 through 16, we see the plea for Onesimus, where he says, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such, as, such a one as Paul, the aged, and now a prisoner of, of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, whom I begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You, therefore, receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deeds might, be, might, not, be out of, or might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntarily. For perhaps he departed for a, for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul's request that we see here was very gracious and very merciful. Really, that's an example alone for us to be able to follow as we see him live that out. You know, He didn't just drop the mic and say, hey, I am Paul, the Paul. Just release this guy. I'm commanding that of you. He didn't drop in and say, hey, I'm, I'm Paul, the old man who started all these other churches. He didn't drop in and say, I'm the apostle. He didn't do any of that. He didn't use his status as a means to twist somebody's arm to get, to, to get them to do what he wanted them to do. He didn't force him. In fact, we saw there that he wrote this on behalf so that Philemon would voluntarily choose to change. He could have easily commanded him to do those things. 
but he wanted Philemon to make a resolution in his own life for himself. Ultimately, he did three things that we can all learn from. He made Philemon aware of the situation and put the news on his heart. The second thing is that he made his appeal. And the third thing that we see is that he allowed the Lord through the Holy Spirit to do the work on his heart and let the Lord work on his heart rather than trying to force the situation. Each one of us can experience that in our own lives, can't we? You know, maybe it's with the person that you're shoulder to shoulder with right now. Like, man, I really wish that this person would stop doing this. And you try to force something when maybe what you should do and what you could do is you could pray about it. Lord, would you help me see this person the way that you want me to see them? Would you help me to love this person, even if that thing that they're doing is really annoying me and I don't really like it? Not trying to force something on somebody, but allow the Lord to work in their hearts. This is an example for us to live in our own lives on how Paul approached conflict. He didn't come in hot and stir the pot and just, you know, like I said, just drop the mic and say, hey, you have to do this. Or he didn't come in and start throwing accusations and saying, it was because of you. You were a wicked master. You're terrible. You did all this. He didn't do any of that. He didn't force anything on either side. He lifted up Philemon while he also lifted up Onesimus. The truth is that we know that we can't force our resolutions on anybody. You know, if I have a resolution of, hey, guys, I'm, this year, I've, my, my brother-in-law sent out this thing and, um, that for his men's ministry at his church, and he's trying to, I think I was, I was briefly reading it yesterday before we ended up coming back down, down the hill. He wanted to get men to more or less activate, you know, it's not just about the, the it's, it's more, there's more to life than just, uh, just coasting along. There's the physical, the spiritual, the mental. And so part of his challenge to these men was, hey, we want to rally up men and be able to um, clock in it's like 3,058 miles or something like that um, to where you are physically, you're going to physically go out and whether it's ride a bike or whether it's run or whether it's walk. And this year, this 2023, we're going to commit together to go and clock in 3,000 miles together. That's a pretty high goal, isn't it? And so if I came up here and said, hey, guys, I'm doing that, and you're all going to be a part of this, that wouldn't really go so well, would it? How many of you would be saying, check, please, I'll go to another church? <laughs> we can't force these things on people. It's no different when it becomes spiritually related. You know, as I was thinking about this, I've, I've thought about gifts that we've tried to force on people, or I've heard that people try to force on people. And whether that's... Uh, you know, getting a, a new lawn mower so that your husband will start to mow the lawn. Or whether that's, guys, don't do this one. Getting your wives a treadmill and saying, here you go, I thought that you might like this. That does not speak encouragement. <laughs> I'm sure that speaks discouragement. But what we, what we can see is that for us to be able to come alongside others and encourage them in a way that allows the Lord to speak to their hearts, allows the Lord to do the work. We can't force our opinion, our direction on anybody, but the Lord can begin to move in people's hearts. And really, that's one way that we can succeed is when we resolve to do things through the Spirit rather than doing things through the flesh. You know, I mean, today is a perfect example of that. In my flesh, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, everything's falling apart. I'm doing communion wrong. My wife's telling me that she's strumming all this and she sounded like it was an absolute disaster. I'm messing up, you know, in, in this in myself. And in my flesh, I'm thinking, gosh, these people are going to leave. They're going to go to another church. But then in my, in my own spirit, I think, you know what? I'm human. Thank you. Like I was reminded, I'm a sinner just like the rest of you guys. We all need grace, right? But the Lord begins to work through us, through the Spirit in, in me. I say, Greg, it's not about the show. It's not about putting on an impression. You know, if you came here for that, I'm sorry. You're not going to get that. There's no smoke machine in, 
there's none of that. There's not the lights. You know, it's, this is as raw as it gets. But it shows me how weak we are in the flesh. But you know what? In, in the moments where I realize how weak I am, that's a moment where I have to stop and remember, okay, I'm weak, but he's strong. And in my weakness, he's made strong. So I don't come up here to do this and say, oh, yeah, glory to Greg. No, I come up here to say glory to God. Yeah. Now back to the book of Philemon. <laughs> it's said that there were about 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire during this time. The average slave was sold to be about um, 500 denarii, where a skilled slave were as priced as high as 50,000 denarii. In this time, one day's worth of wage was one denarius. Now, a slave had the opportunity to buy their freedom back as they worked for their master and as they worked off their debt. Uh, but there's a situation where we see here where if this slave ran away from their master, they would become a wanted fugitive. And when Paul found that Onesimus was a runaway slave, he sought to intercede on his behalf for the benefit of all. And we see that he gives five appeals to Philemon in that short section that we read regarding this man. The first is he, he appeals to Philemon's reputation as a man who brought blessings to others. You know, while he had been a, a blessing to so many others, he now had the opportunity to be a blessing to maybe one of his own, maybe one that uh, some would say don't deserve it. The second thing is that we see he appealed on Christian love rather than the way that the world would handle this situation. You know, that, that kind of love that uh, God calls us to, to love others as we want to be loved, to love, to love as Christ has loved us, not to love just because it benefits us or to love because we get something out of it like the world tells us, the third thing that we see is that he raised awareness to the fact that Onesimus had accepted the Lord, and he had began to walk after him. Well, Onesimus was not just an ordinary slave anymore. He was a fellow brother, a fellow servant of God. The fourth is that since coming to know the Lord, Onesimus had become a resource to Paul in his ministry as he was bound in prison in Rome. Paul even mentions that he was profitable. What a beautiful thing, a beautiful testimony. You know, that this man who was once unprofitable, who was once not walking with God, has since resolved to turn and to change his path, and he began to walk after the Lord, and now he has become profitable. That gives me encouragement. Paul wanted to keep Onesimus with him, but he couldn't maintain a good conscience, knowing that he was someone else's slave, knowing that he was, he was needing to get back and resolve the conflict that was going on in their life. And the fifth appeal that we see was that God's in control. In this situation, I'm sure that, you know, it would have been a, a, a weird situation, but a divine appointment that God had orchestrated for these two to meet and for Onesimus to be given a chance to not only hear the good news and to respond to that, but perhaps he was sent there for a short time so that he could have Paul's assistance in getting back on track and, and become a useful asset for the kingdom work so that they would be together forever, have this, this common purpose of making Jesus known. Now, while Paul made this plea, he knew that it wouldn't be good for Philemon to just say, oh, he's a believer? Okay, yeah, yeah bring him back. I'll, I'll accept him. Because there were many slaves, and if he would have, you know, I'm sure Philemon, he was a wealthy man. He was, you know, he was obviously intelligent enough to be able to have amassed this wealth and to have these slaves. And, and you know, we're not told, like, what, you know, what business or anything that he was in. Um, but if he were just to accept all who were recent converts then I'm sure all slaves, all of his slaves would be like, yeah, oh, he just, I'm a believer. I accepted the Lord. He knew that it wouldn't, it would have caused him more problems than maybe it was worth. 
So Paul, he then offers a solution to this problem as we see that he steps up to the plate, as we'll see in this next sec- section, excuse me, um, in verse 17 through 21. says, If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy uh, from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Paul's solution to this problem was that they would become partners and have somebody to fellowship with. He provides two suggestions on how they can work this arrangement out. The first is that we see that Philemon would receive Onesimus like he would receive Paul. The second is that if there is any debt to be paid, that Paul would pay it. Now that's, that's a generous offer based off of what we said earlier about how much a, an average slave would cost. That Paul was willing to cough up the money so that this man would be free. But Paul was willing to pay that price so that he could continue to be used by the Lord and be an asset for the kingdom. You know, as I was thinking about this situation and what we read there in verse 18, look there again real quick. It says, but if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Does that remind you of anything else? As I was thinking about this, it just illuminated in my mind of this is what Jesus has done for you and I. And when we read through God's word, like, yeah, there's... there's key things that are being taught within this, but all of it points back to Jesus, right? And what an example for us to see this of, you know, Jesus, in our moment of weakness, our sin separated us from God. And we often try to hide, try to run, try to conceal our sin as if God doesn't see that, and as if that's going to solve all of our problems. But then we, enc- we have an encounter with Jesus. We hear the hope and the truth that's spoken into our lives. And when we put our faith and our trust and our identity in- into Jesus and follow after him, we stand before God and he receives us just as we are. But it hasn't always been that way. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that people used to have to seek God by finding a priest, by sacrificing to animals, by taking all these steps. It was a process. But we don't have to do that anymore. Thankfully, we don't have to approach God like that because Jesus has paid the price for us all. You know, as we remembered that communion, as we remembered and partook of communion together, That Jesus hung on that cross. His body was broken. His blood was shed. And he did that for you. He did that for me. He became our substitute so that we could have a relationship with God. That in itself should propel us into this new year. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we become grafted in to the family of God. I've told you guys before, at least I think I have, I really enjoy gardening and planting flowers and planting trees and, you know, anything that's outside. I love doing that. And to get that idea of being grafted into something, a branch that's broken, being grafted back into the tree so that it can have life. God has given us the ability to have life and have life abundantly. When we choose to follow after Jesus, our resolution is that we are tired of our old ways of living. 
I'm tired of this. I don't want to live like this anymore. And you choose to resolve to change, to surrender to God and to allow him to begin to work in your life. For some of us, taking that step was easy. But I know that, you know, the older we get, it can become less easy. Because you have to deal with the fact and the reality of what I've been believing for so long is, is not true. And, and this, this new thing that I'm being told about, this faith in Jesus, this is something where, gosh, like, this is hard. I have to, I have to change. I like the way that I'm living. I don't want to change. I like the sin that I'm in. It brings me pleasure. So maybe for some of you, it's been difficult. Maybe you've had religion shoved down your throat to the point where you become bitter with God, and you don't want anything to do with church. And that just come, it becomes a point where you just kind of scoff at it. I've been to church more times than you will in your life. What, who are you to talk to me? I'm sorry if religion has brought you to a point where you've hardened your heart against God because you have it shoved down your throat so much. But God loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't want to have a religion with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. And that's a two-way commitment. Maybe there's been something that's happened in your life where you don't feel that you deserve God's love. Because you've done something that in your mind is wicked and it is above the standard of God won't forgive me because of this. We're told in the word that God forgives all sins except for one. And that one is the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. We all have the opportunity to know God and not just know him, but have a relationship with him, to grow in that relationship with him. It's not a forced thing. We get to choose that willingly in our own lives. And what a blessing that is, because the truth is that we've all fallen short of God's standard, each one of us. And we deserve death. But God has given us eternal life. He's given us the escape hatch so that we can receive this gift within our own hearts and within our own lives and begin to walk in that way. Now, I know many of you have already accepted the Lord. And you're like, man, when's he going to move on? But there's a reality there where, again, we, we know some of this information, but do we actually take it to heart? Because it's easy to put on the hat. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm forgiven. I know. But then there's so much self-condemnation and we're, we're just, there's this internal struggle, internal battle within us, maybe on a daily, an hourly basis. But maybe your resolution this year is to accept or to re-accept this free gift of salvation and begin to walk with the Lord today. You know, just thinking about the kids up at camp, there's some that rededicated their lives. And what a joy that is, that they're choosing that the way that they were living, they don't want to live like that anymore. They're tired of it. They want to live for the Lord, and they're choosing to redirect. But as Paul closes his resolution to Philemon, he reminds him, he reminds Philemon that he's in the same boat as Onesimus, and that he owed them, indicating that Paul had led both of these men to the Lord. Through this illustration, we can even see this emphasis on believers being salt to the earth and light to the world. Because when people find out that we're Christians, they'll begin to watch your every move. Oh, are they one of those Christians? Or do they actually live out their faith? And I know that that can be daunting because we're not perfect. But again, God doesn't call us to be perfect, and we will, we will never be perfect. We will be far from perfect. But my hope is that each one of us would consider the influence that we have, the people that are around us, and how we are living our lives for the Lord. How that's affecting them and their view on, on God. 
I don't want you guys to be all like timid and just tiptoe around everything. But our witness, sometimes the, we don't even have to say anything. Our witness is through our actions. And so that's what we see Paul here is, is highlighting with this man. But this last thing that we see is he brings this um, letter to a con- uh, an end, to the conclusion. Uh, we'll see in verse 22 through 25 where it says, But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. For I trust that through prayers I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. Amen. In the end, Paul concludes this letter in a very positive note. He asks a personal request, that he would prepare a room for him. He asks for their prayers. Both of these requests were made that in, in anticipation that he would soon be released from prison and have a chance to get back to the church and, and see the, Coloss- the people in Colossae. But as I was reading over and praying over this book throughout this week, the impression that I kept getting, obviously, is this forgiveness, this topic of forgiveness, and this need to display Christ-like forgiveness in our lives. And so a question that I have for you this morning is, is there somebody that you need to forgive that has done something to you? And maybe that it's very deeply rooted. It doesn't have to be recent, but is there somebody that you need to forgive for some harm, for some damage that they've done in your life? Or is there, maybe there's a situation where you've done the hurting Is there somebody that you need to ask forgiveness from or for because of something that you've done towards somebody? Now, we know that the idea of forgiveness is not an easy one. And people often have the wrong perspective of, oh, well, if I forgive them, then that means that it's all like it's wiped clean. But we know that just because you forgive someone doesn't mean that you forget what that person has done to you. But when we allow unforgiveness in our lives, like I said there at the beginning, it becomes like bitterness, that bitter water that, that just isn't good for us. It's not healthy for our soul. It, it really, it becomes a point where it damages us more than it does the other person. Because I know that there's been times in my life where I haven't forgiven somebody, and I'm just stewing on it for so long, and then finally when I come to that person, I'm like, hey, I forgive you for this. Typically the response is, What? What are you talking about? Well, back in 1994, you did this to me. I did? I'm sorry if I did that. You know, and it's, you've been stewing on it. You've been allowing that in your heart, that seed of maybe hatred and bitterness to just continue to grow towards that person when God calls us to forgive, to take a step of faith and trust that God has a plan and a purpose through that. Now, as I say that, I know that can be difficult. Because forgiveness is not always easy. But maybe you're here and that's something that you you need to do to start out this year. Because as we saw here, this man, he owed his master something. But his master had the opportunity to forgive his slave. So that he could bring glory to the Lord. So whether it's, you know, a New Year's resolution for you is forgiveness, or whether it's some, something else, my hope and my prayer is that, you know, as the Lord has just pressed this book onto to my heart, that as we've seen these examples of these men resolving to change, resolving to do something different, that you yourself would resolve to maybe take a step and focus on your spiritual health this year growing in your walk with the Lord, developing spiritually and trusting God. I know that this, this time of year is polarized as, a new, as an opportunity to make New Year's resolutions, but you can do this anytime. It doesn't just have to be on January 1st. Anytime that you want to, you can resolve to change the direction that you're going. 
statistically, like I shared at the beginning, roughly 95% of those resolutions that are made this time of year are not spiritually related. But what if we, as a church, as the body of Christ, ventured out of our comfortableness and ventured into maybe being a little bit uncomfortable, putting ourselves in a position of vulnerability? You know, we were talking about this on the way back down. Persecution isn't always a bad thing. But how comfortable we get as Americans of, oh man, I'm, we're being persecuted. Why? Because the heater's not on. <laughs> we're being persecuted because I can't talk about Jesus at my workplace. But then you see other people who are being detained in a third world country experiencing real persecution. That shows us where our roots really are. And if we truly have a walk with the Lord, but let us not be the 95% that resolve to change something in our life that isn't spiritually related. But let us, as a church, step out of our comfort zone and begin to allow the Lord to stretch us and to grow us into his image. Resolving to become more like Christ. Resolving to seek to walk with him. Now, I know that resolutions aren't always easy, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this, okay? Okay. Resolutions aren't always easy. We all know that. Maybe you don't make resolutions because you've tried it in the past and you failed. But let me encourage you to make a resolution that is achievable and obtainable. If you want to resolve to say, hey, I want to read the entire Bible this year, praise the Lord. I hope that you can do that. But instead of making the resolution of, I'm going to read through the entire Bible this year, and, you know, your Bible isn't read a whole lot, maybe you would start by saying, hey, this year I'm going to start getting in that routine. And you're reading five minutes a day. You're reading a chapter a day. Because as you read a Bible through a year, you'll know that you have to read at least four or five chapters in order to get through the Bible in an entire year. That can be daunting. You miss one day and you think, oh boy, I'm never going to catch up. Take baby steps. God doesn't call you to jump over the Grand Canyon to become the new you. Sometimes it takes walking down the path into the Grand Canyon and then back up to get to the destination. Allow the Lord to work in your life and allow yourself to resolve to become a better version of you by this time next year. That's my hope and prayer for us as a whole, as a church that we wouldn't be the same, but that we would be changed through the power and through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity as we've had to be able to get into your word, and I pray that as we close this service that we would be able to settle our hearts. Lord, if there's something that you're putting on our hearts right now, help us to just surrender that to you. And help our hearts be in a place where we can freely sing without distraction and to lift our voices up to you. It's not about how we sound, Lord, but it's about how we sing these words and we're just crying out to our Heavenly Father who loves us and wants to have a relationship with us. We thank you and we praise you for this time. And that, Lord, I do pray that you know anyone in here that is making a resolution or choosing to resolve something, that they would um, have your blessing and, and your, uh, your guidance, your wisdom on how they would be able to achieve that. But Lord, maybe there's somebody in here that needs resolve to, to even just to take that step of faith and follow after you, to rededicate their lives to you. I pray that they would do that this morning. They wouldn't leave here without having that business taken care of. But we thank you and praise you for this time, and we lift it up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.